Matt Bauer, welcome to Suit Up the Podcast. Thank you, Terrence. Very nice to be here. I was going to ask you, where actually are you? You're in central time. Where are you? I am in Iowa, which if you know where that is, it's only because we just got dumped on by like the largest snowfall in recorded 10 years history here. Yeah, I mean, I know that because I was following the Iowa caucuses and it was all oh, about- Oh, yes, that too. <laughs> the, the snow kind of stuff. So yeah, this is your kind of big, not not to insult Iowa, but it's that time every four years where Iowa becomes the On thing. the news, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. people just assume I'm from Idaho. They're, bless their heart, there's a few guys I've, I think I've even had on the podcast, they still think that I'm from Indiana or Idaho. It happens. It starts with an I. Yeah. No one knows Sussman where it is. I. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, good morning, Iowa. And good morning. You're in Australia, correct? I'm in Australia. Yeah, I'm kind of back here for like an extended Christmas. That's awesome. Break. Um, yeah, obviously we'll we'll get to this, but obviously like we released a film this year, which has mm -hmm. it's been amazing, but it's also been quite tiring, and it's nice to be back in sunny mm -hmm. hometown Australia for a few months. So. I want to actually dig into a little bit of that, but first and foremost, introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you? What do you do? We're going to talk about your documentary, which is an award-winning documentary, The Other Fellow. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Matthew Bauer. Uh, I am a documentary filmmaker. Um, yeah, I grew up here in Adelaide, Australia. Um, and Where I is that in Australia, just out of curiosity? Because I have a vague idea of some of the geography. So it's actually in the middle, it's in the very middle at the bottom of Australia. And you, you know, you, you say you're from Iowa, but like here, they have these weird parochial things here. And one of them is actually we're on a half hour time difference. It's the only place in the world that has a 30 what? minute time difference. So when we were scheduling this today, I just told <laughs> we were in Sydney because it really throws people off when I do these things, when they're like, why is that on a 30 minute difference? But yes, it's a little quirk um of here but yeah I, I grew up here and then I ended up kind of attending like NYU film school um which I think was one of their kind of rare Australian students um and then this is my first film um yeah congratulations that, a documentary about the lives of real men around the world mm -hmm whose name is James Bond. Um, and I think the way we connected, I think that we were both nominated in some kind of, in the James Bond community awards. Yes. The Golden Bullet uh, the Golden awards. Bullets. Yes, yes. And we sort of connected through that, so. That, which is one of the things I think is really cool about the James Bond fan community. We, we talked a little about this pre-recording, but I like to be, there are a lot of James Bond podcasts, which I think are great, cool, more power to them. I like being a James Bond fan who also happens to podcast and do other things. So yeah. I, I find it interesting. But what got you into documentary filmmaking specifically? It, to us, it was just this concept. Um, yeah, de definitely when I was at film school, it wasn't like like documentary is is the plan mm -hmm. um, at all. Do you know what I mean? Although I think actually thinking back, I was much more of a documentary fan than I think a lot of people were, mm -hmm. you know, like I was a massive like Errol Morris mm -hmm. guy kind of growing up, um, you know, and then this film, a lot of people miss it. This film actually is an Errol Morris film. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it's a very different version of that, but the actual structure of how it's put together mm -hmm. is the same. Um, but yeah, I was always, you know, I, I was, one, I would actually go and see like documentaries in the cinema and kind of that kind of thing. Um, but it was never the plan. I remember we, we had a documentary class at film school, which I really didn't pay much attention in. I was like, this is just one of those things you've got like a tick of box. Um, but when the idea of this film came about, it mm -hmm. was a documentary yeah. concept. Um, and it just kind of led led to that, really. I, I think probably because because of the James Bond connections, but also, and again, it wasn't really the plan, but being my first documentary, I kind of, at first I kind of thought, oh, you just do a few interviews and you cut them together and you got a film. And and, and then I, I realized that these things are really a lot of work. And one of the things that comes up is you're not actually there for, for what the big story is a lot of the time. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll see in the film, there's, for instance, like, a scene where one of the James Bonds does a 
casino commercial. Yes. And I love that scene because it was something where we were actually able to kind of like be there, like in the moment of it. But with a lot of our stories, the, the, the key points actually ends up being in like the Second World War or, mm-hmm. or, you know, even just a few years earlier, there's like a murder plot line where the guy's being chased by the police. And like we weren't, I, I mm-hmm. wasn't with the guy when the murder <laughs> happened and all that kind of thing. But actually it allowed for some of the reenactment sequences you see in the mm-hmm. film that actually were able to have like, Russian planes firing missiles and radar screens and 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 helicopters and SWAT teams and that kind of thing, um, which kind of did give me a chance to kind of flex that mm-hmm. kind of more narrative kind of muscle um, sort of in it as well. So, yeah, I, I, it, it is a documentary, but I think it probably has a higher level of that kind of yes. narrative sort of stuff. Um, yeah. That's the thing that stood out to me in The Watch, because I'll be honest, I'm not a go-to documentary person. I mostly, when it's nonfiction, I I tend to read it or listen to an audiobook. But you maximize the the medium of film so well for this documentary. It did have a strong narrative heft to it where you have these twists and turns. Like, you actually have a documentary that people could spoil. That is so foreign a concept by and large to any other documentary I've ever heard of let alone seen. Yeah, it 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 does have it, it does have kind of twists and turns to it, kind of this film. But I think that was kind of my approach. I mean, I think coming over from a slightly more narrative-y sort of place, it, you know, th- this isn't really like an information, you know, you say you kind mm-hmm. of read or kind of whatever. And I can understand with say a film like like an inconvenient truth, like mm-hmm. at- or climate change film. Yes. You, you could either see the film or read the book, if you know what mm-hmm. I mean. And you get the same information um, kind of out of it. Whereas I think for this, it was meant to be, it's much more of like a film experience. Mm-hmm. It's not, you're not really meant to be learning. That you may take away themes from the film or whatever, but it is designed to be much more of one of those sort of cinematic kind of experiences, which does it does have kind of twists and turns and reveals and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that does come from, you know, being a fan of like, I wouldn't say James Bond. It's not really that. It's more like thriller mm-hmm. cinema, you know, like I, I love films like, you know, like the kind of like the usual suspects or the sixth sense were very much kind of my era, but also like, especially in television, it's like, it was always mm-hmm. like lost and 24 yep. for me. And it's like, for me, the thing, you know when the kaiser soze reveal in the usual suspects i was like eight years old and i like leaned forward and was like Mm -hmm. what the what the fuck just happened what what is happening here and 24 which is like my favorite thing ever has okay so genuine question there is your last name actually spelled the same way as jack bauer it's spelled the same way as Jack Bauer. Um, yes, which I don't know if that was like part of the appeal. I, I don't <laughs> know, but it is, it's 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 a cute thing, especially in relation to like this film. Well, that's um, most of the first things when I heard about this film and I saw your name and I was like, there's a version of this where like, would yeah. you ever name a son Jack Bauer? Because yeah. the, the irony there. It only doesn't come up. I, I'm surprised that uh, 24, I think, has been slightly forgotten mm-hmm. in, in a, just in the kind of like, I think the current consciousness, I don't yes. think a lot of the kids these days have seen 24. Um, and, you know, like, like, in, like in this movie, the, the, the ornithologist James Bond is played by the actor who played President Logan on 24. Yes. And if you're a 24 fan, you know who President Logan is. And and again, in the world of 24, it's like, I can't really tell you what's cool about President Logan because of spoilers. Um, but but yeah, that, that was all very much my kind of sort of upbringing in film. And th- those moments that make you go, oh, mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and also those moments that kind of make you go, like, what's going on here, you know, and things that do have kind of like big sort of twists and like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, moments. Um, and we did try and get, I, I, I think there's more of that in this film than people are maybe expecting from our, it, it, it is a film about men named James Bond. And I think it actually, like, I think it probably surprises people how much this is about men named James Bond. But within that, we found some very interesting twists and turns on that formula. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's just amazing at how very distinct as the film progresses, we really get an idea of what it means to, because like, I have a weird name. Terrence Leahy is not the name that any fictional character ever has or ever will be. The closest yes. I got was some dude that like assaulted a woman was named Terrence Lafleur, And okay. I had friends sending me it. I'm like, ah, sorry, he's black. Yep. I'm not pretty clear difference there. Don't worry. One yep. more alias burned. But James Bond is, was picked. And I like that you guys established right from the start. The name was picked because of how flat the name really is. So yeah. it makes sense. It's a strong name. It works. It just has that right resonance. And I think that it's fascinating to see that it's stuck around in a way that like a name Simon Templar, the saint, just yeah. hasn't. No one's named Simon Templar. Yeah, no, I, it is. I mean, Fleming said that he wanted to pick a really, a really flat, quiet name. And actually... I don't know if you've ever seen that original interview that's in there. Weirdly, unbelievably, that's the only filmed interview with Ian Fleming like, yes. like ever, which is crazy when you think back on it. But we would have had more, but actually like that clip was quite expensive to buy from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. But what he expands on is he says that at the time, heroes were called things like Peregrine Carruthers or mm -hmm. Bulldog Drummond. I think he's specifically talking about like Detective Noir. Mm -hmm sort of stuff there and indiana jones is actually a, a, is, is a comparable kind of name that is very much like of an era mm -hmm. but i think what fleming wasn't planning when he did that was the longevity of bond that has happened is in mm -hmm. part because it's one of those completely bland names james bond sounds as normal today as it did then it's not a name that's dated in the mm -hmm. way of some of those very like traditional kind of like hero names of the 1950s were um and and again by accident i think he seeded something which was able to continue mm -hmm. forever which funnily enough for my guys who are called james bond i mean a it makes complete sense that there are so many people i, I doubt there's any indiana joneses out there <laughs> But whereas, of course, you're going to have thousands of guys around the world who, because mm -hmm. of why he chose this name, this is going to happen to. And also, they're going to be keep being called James Bond because it's not an outdated name. And this series just continues forever in this way that kind of like nothing else really has. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I found it fascinating. And like I said, the narrative to this documentary is what I want people to take away from this interview. It is worth watching for that yeah I, I i hope people do check it out i think a lot of the kind of like bond fans and stuff sort of checked it out and i think ge our general reaction mm -hmm. and we've made peace with this is people I, I, like yeah that, that well they're like that was much better than i was expecting you, you know but i think you know and and i'm kind of proud of this as a filmmaker is we have kind of kept a lot of what happens in the film kind of quiet and mm -hmm. it, it is in the promotion of it we, we have kind of had to lean into this slightly zany idea of like wow it's a film about men named james bond and there is a lot of kind of like i think like co comedy mm -hmm. kind of stuff to it but i, I don't the know what you guys start talking about needing to have your ids at all moments if you get pulled over when your name is james bond such a great laugh moment in the movie and it's edited really well to make that land perfectly yeah and for the i mean what happened when we were filming it is it, you know th there's all the expected stuff you, you know and i kind of went into this going like these guys are going to get a lot of aston martin jokes they're going to get a lot of shake not stir jokes and it, it kind of in terms of the narrative of the film you'll see we actually kind of get all that out the way in a big opening montage mm -hmm. and the idea of that was to then strand you in the middle of sweden and everyone speaking swedish and, and, and you're kind of meant to be going okay where the hell is this gonna yes. go now that we've done all that and then suddenly there's like a guy driving through the town in an aston martin and it kind of goes from there um but we did but but when it came to that is I'd actually done all these separate interviews, you, you know, with all these guys. And we realized in editing that they'd all told this exact same, well, a, a great majority had told this exact same story, which is 
they must have ID on them at all times. And it's because if you get pulled over by the police or you have some kind of an encounter with a police officer, they're going to ask you for your driver's license. And if you don't have your driver's license on you, they'll say, give us your name, you know, and your date of birth. And so obviously if you're in that situation where you're under police attention and you tell them your name is James Bond, the police officer is going <laughs> to think you're, you're taking the mickey with him. And, and it makes complete sense, but that's stuff I didn't expect, which is that these guys have through life had to actually think many steps ahead of all of the things that could potentially go wrong. And so one of them is, yeah, you have to have your ID on you at all times. And then, of course, the, the kind of other twist on that was, and, and we obviously it's a small sample. We didn't make this up, mm -hmm. but it was the African-American guy who actually ends up going to prison for this, we had all these other guys where, you know, eventually they went and checked the social security number and went, oh, sir, your name actually is James Bond. I understand we've had a mistake here. Whereas the African-American guy, because of the altercation he got into mm -hmm. the, the police officer arguing over his name actually being James Bond, he ended up going to prison for that because of, the, you know, the incident that, that, that resulted from it. Um, and it was those kind of things where it was like, wow, there is kind of another level mm -hmm. to all this. No, it's fascinating, especially given that I, I almost spoiled something, not going to. Rewind, T. My next question actually is, what was the difference between, have you noticed much of a difference between the fan reactions from James Bond community versus other people that maybe just have a casual acquaintance with James Bond? Yeah, I mean, we made, we made this to be a general audience kind of mm -hmm. proposition um and not so much a james bond fan thing if, if you go on youtube which obviously you are and, and you kind of look up like bond fan films or whatever there is actually like an admirable amount of feature length like james bond fan films that are on wow. there you know and it, and it, it is like they've it's always the director playing bond for whatever you can oh I, we we why. there's shocking i'm sure the psychological connection uh, just, yeah, yeah yeah and then they found the most attractive girl they know to be the bond girl you know and kind of this kind of thing but there's obviously there's like reams of james bond fan I mean, this that we're doing here is sort of james bond fan content in a way um and there are some like fan made documentaries kind of out there which and I, i'm not insulting it I, i'm just saying mm -hmm. it's a different form they're more of yeah. like a youtube video mm -hmm. form and you know the interviews might be done on something like this sort of thing um, but we definitely wanted to differentiate from mm -hmm. that and kind of try and make something which was much more of like a general audience mm -hmm. uh, sort of film. And so, yeah, I mean, we've we've kind of had a, a lot of the people who've seen it from more documentary angle where, again, were like, I actually enjoyed this a lot more than I was expecting for kind of a Bond thing. Um, and I think for the Bond fans, a lot of them have kind of been like, it's good to have something sort of fresh and new and there isn't just a, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's it's the 60th or 50th or 65th anniversary of Goldfinger this week. <laughs> and all the, all the, 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 the all and every, uh, I, I have this thing for the Aston Martin. I'm not the biggest Aston Martin fan because I think the Aston Martin has somewhat overtaken. Yes world of you know in this world of wonderful lotus espries and this <laughs> roger moore the best james bond never drove an aston martin guys you know like it's always <laughs> like oh and it's all ah oh, the aston martin everyone well, let's have another thing about the aston martin mm -hmm. you know um and it's like i i think we wanted to make something that in that world was was kind of fresh and and kind of by coincidence our plan was to kind of release this at the same time as No Time to Die. We were like, let's get this up at the same time and we'll kind of feed yeah. off the publicity for that. Mm -hmm. But weirdly, I think we've kind of landed in James Bond land in this complete gulf of absolutely nothing. Uh, sorry, I don't want to insult a new Kim Sherwood book or something, but I mean, cinematically, <laughs> cinematically we've landed in this giant hole of... No, with mm -hmm. even even there's no news on a new film or kind of whatever um and i, I think for bond fans it has meant there is this sort of new piece of bond related mm -hmm. content out there um but yeah but general audience really died i mean we were amazed we when we were like how how are people going to review this film and we were like we weren't sure because this is a documentary about men mm -hmm. named james bond 
and we kind of expected a certain amount of like like proper film reviewers to be like this is the stupidest movie you know, in a landscape yes. of, you know, Iraq and Ukrainian war documentaries and that kind <laughs> of thing, are they going to dismiss this? And actually, like, it got reviewed really well and people were really taking it up and, you know, film festivals and that kind of thing really mm-hmm. sort of got on board. Um, yeah, yeah, and sort of got it. So it was a very rambling Well, I, I think it's fascinating because really that's kind of the same world that the, I think the James Bond films tend to inhabit, where it is either prestige level product where we get a casino royale and you're like, ah, yes, good. Like look at the height of the story, what it can be, or it's die another day. Yeah. And it it somehow manages to keep persisting despite very large gaps in quality and a fan base that will adore it no matter how bad it gets at like a Godzilla movie. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Uh, one of the other things that I really took away from the documentary was you do a good job of you set up right from the beginning what the problems are and then it actually gets to a nice serious place where you're gripped like we were talking about it has this thriller level quality was that something that you expected to get or was that complete and utter surprise I think I was kind of expecting this to kind of start as a comedy. I mean, I mean, what happened was is I just I just came up with this idea and I literally just found every James Bond I could on the internet. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's a challenge in itself because you have to mm-hmm. filter through a lot of stuff. And so I probably sent out like, let's say like 250, j- just a copy paste email being like, hi, mm-hmm. my name's Matt. I'm thinking of doing this film have you got any interesting stories to tell? And the stories that came back, they were just more serious more quickly than I was kind of expecting. And I think they were the, so there were a lot of just stock responses, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, I get lots of martini jokes and that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. it was, I think every one of them that you see in the film, it's the bomb that, yes, they're James Bond, but there's a twist on that, you know? And so, Say one of the first ones was like the gay New York theater director yes. that, that you see in the film. And then he came back and he was like, Oh, I was actually on the David Letterman show reading the top 10 good things about being James Bond list. And he was gay as, as mm-hmm. well, which obviously is an interesting counterpoint when your mm-hmm. name is James Bond. And so it made sense to have him with the family in Texas. So there's there's a family in Texas yes. where and this is a slight spoiler, but they, they're a family of four James Bonds in succession. And I had just happened to ping upon one of those four, oh. no, not the other one, but it just happened. I, he yeah. was one of them found on LinkedIn. And then he wrote back and he was like, oh, actually, like this is our family <laughs> tradition. And, and so, of course, they've been doing this before the Bond films and they mm-hmm. decided to keep, you know, since then. And he was like, you're actually going to get four Bonds in one here um and so that was that was sort of one there, there is and again I'm, I'm dancing around spoilers here slightly mm-hmm. but there was one who wrote back to me and he was actually the very first one who did oh wow who kind of said he was using james bond as kind of like a smoke screen to hide from elements in his past mm-hmm. um and again i was like that's really interesting i wasn't kind of expecting that um well, and, and that entire story feels like a noir thriller really yeah yeah and, and and with them it was like wow that's like completely unexpected mm-hmm. um and, but then i mean also i mean again with the spoiler a lot of people when they see the film they think the spoiler is the murder whereas that's kind of just leading up yeah. to things but then it, again during our search th- they were in our initial batch and then mm-hmm. as we were filming a guy called james bond got arrested for murder and we wrote to him in prison and he agreed to it and said yes and then but the news story we'd initially read about him was man named james bond confused for murder suspect and there was another guy in the same town called james bond who was like a maga hat wearing gun nut and he was copping flack because everyone thought he was the shooter um in in the murder and so he came in and then i guess i'd say to kind of finish it off with there's a swedish james bond in the film mm-hmm. who's Again, you know, he's he's a Swedish man who's literally turned himself into James Bond. But then his whole story had this whole Fleming mm-hmm. World War II aspect to yeah. it. 
Um, and then finally with the Fleming thing, I mean, I think most people know about the ornithologist whose mm -hmm. name was stolen to name James Bond. I think we've all kind of heard that. But, but I'll be honest, I, I forgot he was from the States. For whatever reason, I yeah. just assumed he was British, which yeah. is an interesting little fact that I forgot about. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a, he was a guy from Philadelphia, which again is funny because he's somewhat disconnected from the Bond thing. But what they had in common was Jamaica. You know, he was the guy that chronicled the birds of Jamaica. So, of course, it was in Ian Fleming's house. And he saw it and took the name. But what I didn't know, and I think a lot of people don't know, is that a lot then happened with Fleming and those guys afterwards. And, you know, they heard about this and they actually went and met him at GoldenEye. Um, and it turned out that in that Ian Fleming interview I was talking about earlier, that was the day they arrived and they actually turned the camera around and film the meeting. And so I, I think on kind of all the levels, there was this other kind of level there mm -hmm. that I wasn't expecting. And they were things that had drama and, and kind mm -hmm. of thrillerish elements towards them. And I'd say I definitely kind of moved towards mm -hmm. those. Yeah. The, the, there was real kind of cinema. I mean, especially with the Fleming thing, it allowed us to do real kind of historical documentary kind of stuff. But even within that, they still like, you know, got on a Pan Am plane, to, you know, you know, to, to Jamaica in the 1960s mm -hmm. to visit Goldeneye, which is not, it's not like a thriller thing, but there's a lot of cinema uh -huh. to that, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, we definitely tended towards those aspects. Mm -hmm. Now, did I understand correctly? It took nine, 10 years to complete this project? Yeah, it was about nine years in the end. I mean, I remember at film school, they told us that documentaries only take seven years. And that's from your like first idea though, all the okay. way through, all the way through oh, like okay. production, setting the thing up, going yeah. and filming, and then the actual like release of the film. Um, and I, I at first was like, wow, like these people are slow. Like how can it, then you just, you know, you watch an Errol Morris film and you go, oh God, you just do a few interviews on a background, you cut it together and chuck in some things and you're done. And then when you actually get into it, you you, you do see that, that there's a kind of another level to it. And I think with this film, uh, I'd seen some of my comrades at film school where they say like, don't rush your first feature. Like they really are like, don't do that. And you end up seeing why, because some people come out the gate and they go and try and make something too quickly. Mm. And especially in narrative cinema, right? Say you've got a hundred grand to go film your first movie. You blow all of that on the shoot, right? So you're trying to make it as good as possible. If you then get in the edit and the film is bad, you you can't go and reshoot. The, the, mm. You might have like one day left for reshoot, so but you can't reshoot the whole film. Whereas with documentary for better or worse you have the option of kind of going redoing things and it is more like slowly building this mm. sort of sculpture um okay. kind of thing if you will and so with this i mean five years ago this film was terrible like it it, it was terrible i mean eight years ago it was terrible like like you, you're dealing with this kind of like quite bad rough cut mm -hmm. the entire time that you are slowly polishing Mm -hmm. until it all sort of works you know and, and it was for us it was literally like once it was at the point where it was like this is working we kind of went to film festivals with it um but yeah I, I had to put it it's hard to explain but that nine years goes quick uh-huh and you're on a and you go what were we doing in 2016 you're like what was 2016 <laughs> but like say 2016 was the whole ornithologist reenactment for instance and even though actually and again once you get to the final cut you're like we, you know, you film 10 minutes of stuff and there's only a minute of it in the final movie. But that was like, oh, we do need to do like a 1960s reenactment. We need a mm -hmm. 1960s house to put it in. Yes. Um, we wanted to get a good actor mm -hmm. to play him. So we ended up going to President Gregory. It's I was so movie. impressed when that, when he showed up on screen, I was like, I recognize that character actor. Like they got a fantastic character actor to play him. Yeah, he's an he's an Emmy nominated, you know, proper kind of actor. Um, and and but you know, we you go to his agent, for instance, and then kind of speak with him. And then he at the time he kind of had he's passed away now, sadly, oh. and he he was dealing with health problems, so he couldn't come to London. So we then had to go film him in Los Angeles. And at this point, I was like, oh God, like this is now probably more work than I needed for my bird guy reenactment. At the same time, I've got Gregory. It's <laughs> 
has agreed to be in the film. And so then it was like raising the money to go to there to kind of film mm. with him, yada, yada. And before you know it, yep, that's a year <laughs> done. Um, but I, I think especially with this film as well, because there were so many separate characters, I think mm -hmm. the edit was more difficult than mm -hmm. for a standard kind of documentary. Um, you're, you've literally got all these plates spinning. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, well, yeah. You balance but, them but, perfectly. Because really, I think that the the thing that I really caught watching this film was the fact that editing was spot on. To keep the pace you. moving quite well, everything. I I appreciate it. So thank you. It was well worth it. Thank you. I'll send this clip to our editor, Leslie Posso. <laughs> will like will will like hearing that that clip. Um yeah, she I, I basically found my editor. I was kind of rough cutting it myself the whole way. Mm -hmm. And I eventually was like, I need to now get a really good mm -hmm. editor, like a really good editor to come in and who can like figure out how to bring this together and in, in into like a cohesive sort of whole. Um, and she kind of came in and she, weirdly enough, I thought an editor was going to complicate it, but actually she simplified it. Cause you'll see in the film, we can't, it is kind of like we focus on one character mm -hmm. at a time largely. Whereas I was trying to be like to Chris Nolan with it. Like I was cutting them together, like create and being like each story is in three acts and that kind of thing where yeah. she kind of went, let's just give them each their 10 minutes. And then in the mm -hmm. final act of the film, we'll come back mm -hmm. to all of them for a final yes. kind of two minutes. That and end actually, scene really actually reminded me of, that end segment reminded me of Oppenheimer in the way that it moved through the paces, resolving everyone's stories. Yeah, and actually Nolan does do that. If you, if you look at the end of like, say the Dark Knight or something, it goes through like a final whip round. Mm -hmm. Within a, a final scene of 24 does this when it goes to the final boxes as well um but, but it is it is kind of a, a, a tactic to do it but we wanted to avoid you know at the end of a doc sometimes you have like epilogue where it's like yes a title card and a where are they now we didn't mm -hmm. want to do that we wanted that to kind of be like a whole movement of it um but yes yeah, she really managed to kind of bring it together and i think what kind of really came about in the final part of the film which was never quite the plan was you do get this real vibe at the end of the film that by doing this film, it has brought them all together and it's mm -hmm. kind of been a healing experience for them. And what happened was while we were shooting, kind of as slightly as a joke, we'd filmed them like they were in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, but for guys called James Bond, and we'd put them together and, and done that. And then one of our characters, the New York James Bond, had said in his interview that, that doing this film has been like therapy for me, do you know, and through meeting these other James Bonds, I felt better. And then obviously during COVID where Zoom meetings were happening, mm -hmm. we were then able to get them together on a Zoom. And it, it did kind of bring about this kind of idea at the end of the film of like connection, mm -hmm. being able to help solve a, a problem. And I think that's universal. You know, that's not just about, because obviously like who's called James Bond, you, you know, it's a very specific mental mm -hmm affliction these guys have but i think that is universal i think whatever you're going through in this world you, you know having connection to others going through the same thing can kind of help and i think that really does I don't know how to put it the ending of the film is much more heartwarming mm -hmm. than, than i was it's not really my style you, you know <laughs> i i like you know what i mean like the end of a 24 mm -hmm episode or something where someone gets shot or you know what I mean it's more of a darker kind of thing but yeah in the end kind of having this slightly more heartwarming conclusion did sort of there's still some twists and turns but there's also quite a lot of like heart at the mm -hmm. end in there yeah uh two other questions that I have for you specifically related to um Bond in general I heard that you are a fan of the books and I'm genuinely curious which is your favorite yeah, I am. I, I'm a fan of the books in the sense that I've read them all once. I I, I do kind of, I, I would really like to do them again now. Um, Like I, you know, I was a Bond fan as a kid. And then mm -hmm. probably when I was about 12, I bought my first James Bond kind of book. And at first, 
you know, there's that thing before you really get how things work cinematically. Yes. The first James Bond book was Moonraker. And weirdly, that was oh. my first James Bond film mm-hmm. as well. And, and at the time I read it, I was really annoyed that it wasn't like the film. Yes. You know what I mean? Because you're a kid. You don't, you don't get why it's actually good that it's not like the film. I was mm-hmm. like, this is nothing like, like the movie, you know. But then eventually when I started reading them, I was like, this is really cool that you have this completely alternate and in some ways it yeah. is the real timeline of James mm-hmm. Bond, you know, and just all those really cute things like, you know, you get to the end of, you know, From Russia With Love. Mm-hmm. And actually that does have like like a twist ending, you know, Bond gets kicked with the shoes and blacks mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. And then the next book is Dr. No, which is obviously the complete, you Off know, the films. Yeah. The film. um, and then like, say that the, the end of like, You Only Live Twice, the, the novel, where he like falls from the balloon mm-hmm. and wakes, and even though the amnesia thing can kind of not work in cinema, it really works in that. And then when he's like, he finds the newspaper and he's like, "Oh, Russia, I need mm-hmm. to go to Russia," and you're like, "Oh shit, no, 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 that's that, that's wrong. Don't go to Russia. That's that's whatever." Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of stuff in the books, I would really like to see brought back. You know, in the mm-hmm. films, you know, I've always kind of been like, especially the end of "You Only Live Twice." Yes, the novel would make an amazing. Amazing. I mean, what if, you know, the end of a new Bond film, Bond is getting on like a 747 plane mm. to Russia or China thinking he's from there it would be really cool. Um, yeah, but there is that kind of thing in the books of that there is kind of, we've sort of end up on this theme today, a bit, but there's a lot more twists and turns and like actual mm-hmm. like cliffhangers yeah. go, going on in them. And I think that part of it's really cool. And yeah, I've always wanted to reread them again. I have this weird thing. I've never actually finished the man with the golden gun and i think it's that's understandable yeah but it's also this weird i think there's something in me that always liked having a a bit left Uh uh-huh you know what i mean like kind of like like Uh the weird thing of like once you've seen all the i remember being quite deflated when i'd finally watched every bond film there was because you're like oh god it's over Mm-hmm. now you know and i think always we want that one more film or that mm-hmm. one sort of whatever but i don't it's a weird thing but i've never I, i've never finished that last one so actually tying into that question then have you seen i i haven't seen it but that they came out the 24 movie back a while ago did you end up seeing it yeah i mean there's a t- i mean it's it's a tv movie that's in between season six and, and okay. seven um, and it throws people a lot these because of all the great rights issues that go on in the streaming world. Generally, that's not included on the streaming services, oh, which really okay. annoys a lot of the 24 fans. Um, that, but no, I mean, there was always like a rumored, like proper big screen 24 movie, but I think they always struggled with, you know, then it would just be a Jack Bauer yeah action movie action movie which i think would be totally fine but i think a lot of people miss with 24 that it, it's 24 is a real ensemble mm-hmm. piece it's not it kind of became at the end a bit the jack bauer action show um yeah but again with 24 i mean we're all 24 fans are still always hanging out for that that one more you know do a six hour mini series <laughs> or something you never quite want these things to be over um, and yes, yeah, I, I was listening to your Dial of Destiny podcast earlier. And I think, again, with that film, I think it has a lot of that that weird thing of we all want that one more. But mm-hmm. then once we've, we, there's a weird feeling once that's done and you're like, that's it. I've seen it now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah. actually, I'll ask you another film related question because I consider you a film expert. Do you prefer Dial of Destiny or Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? I think I prefer Kingdom of the Crystal Skull in the end. Yeah, yeah. I, well, it, it's a Steven Spielberg it's true. film. Yes. I, I think that has a big part of it. And I think that th- there is something more interesting about a bad Indiana Jones than a bland. Mm-hmm. Yes. Jones. Well, and there's so weird. It's, the it's, it's... highs are high, but the lows are also low. And between those two, you have an interesting dialogue of those two bits versus yeah, it... like Dial of Destiny. It's just kind of. Yeah. And, and it's like two and a half hours of like, it, it's weird when you. Oh, yeah. It's nearly three hours. 
It's a long film. And it, the thing is, here's the Indiana Jones Dark Destiny. I, and I would compare it a lot to Spectre and No Time to Die, actually. Yes. In the sense of like all of those films. The first, I actually saw it at, there's a, a place called the Skyline Drive-In in New York in Brooklyn. And the first time I saw it, it was actually there. And so you've got New York in the background on the river. And that's where I saw it at a drive-in theater. And it was kind of cool. And I'm assuming mm-hmm. that Dial of Destiny, it was kind of cool the first yeah. time. It was actually a really good experience on a mm-hmm. Friday night in New York oh, yeah. to see the Indiana Jones film. And actually the first time I saw Spectre, I thought it was great. And the first time I saw No Time to Die, I thought it was great. And all those three films, when you watch them again, you go like, oh, there's, there's some problems here, actually. Once you've gotten over that initial, like... The, the, the new- fun, the adrenaline. Yeah, well, just the new, you're like, there was just something mm-hmm. new. You know, there's there's a bit inspector where he talks to the rat and he's like, who do you work for? Y- you know, and he's had a few too many drinks. And a oh, rat yes. And oh, he's like, goodness. who do you work? And the first time I saw that, I was like, that's so cool. I love that in a James Bond film, that just happened. Um, but then often with those ones, you kind of see them again and you're like, there's some real problems um, kind of here. And especially in Dial of Destiny, watching it again, you kind of go, oh, there must be a lot in this three hours. And there kind of isn't. Like, there's no real, like, reason why it, it's it's three. It's not like all of these different mm-hmm. things kind of happen. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I was listening to your podcast on it. My big thing with that film is I, I, wish, I wish the time travel thing happened halfway through. Yes. Because, like, the, fir- the the whole part, part of it, it is just a bit like Spectre does it as well, where it's all like we go to a location and mm-hmm. then we find a clue. And then it's like, mm-hmm. ah, we now have to go here to find the next clue. And it's like two hours of that. And yeah, it, actually, when the time travel things happens, I'm like, oh, this has actually just got good. Mm-hmm. This has just got interesting. And I was like... And again, because people are so careful with spoilers, I was like, are we now about to go through all the previous indie films or are we mm-hmm. about to go back to Temple of Doom or kind mm-hmm. of something? And actually, in the end, it's just like five minutes. Yeah. And then we're back there again, whereas I'm kind of like, that could have been a really interesting second half mm-hmm. of the, you know, what if the Temple of Doom of that film was... You know what? You know, like how he's always like in a temple, having to yeah. like get away from these old traps and things. Mm-hmm. What if he's in a temple when the traps are new? What if there was some Ooh. mission to do uh-huh. when he got? I'm like, that's really good, and instead, it kind of it do- it do- it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that I not to complain too much about the movie. There are elements I like. the The first like twenty minutes, hands down, I adore. But that's because it's literally just retreading the same things I love about all the other Indiana Jones. So why wouldn't I love it? But once the boat, the whole boat sequence, why did you waste the incredible Antonio Banderas in this nothing role? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, it's funny. Yeah. The first 20 minutes is the first 20 minutes feels like an old Indy. And I also like its placement in time Mm -hmm. is where if they had have made Indy four in 1993, Mm -hmm that's where we would be. And I think that's cool, but you're right. The air falls out of that movie on the boat. It really, you're kind of with it till then. And there's something on the boat where it just, you you know what I mean? You you Mm -hmm. feel it in an audience Mm -hmm. when the film just dies. It, it, It is in that boat bit and there's something. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, Antonio Banderas is there. And, and then there's just a long dialogue sequence where I think she's trying to light the dynamite yeah. on fire or something like that. But it, it's, it's this long talky bit where you just feel the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's because that whole scene is supposed to be designed to build tension. If this was like an Elmore Leonard novel, you're supposed to be feeling that sense of impending drama that's about to occur. Yeah. But it just doesn't quite make it so instead it just it literally feels like someone's trying to keep the air pressure and it is just releasing as they're trying to keep it held close yeah well i mean they're also keeping what's ju- only just managed to be there kind of anyway there, there's also this weird thing in that film where as far as i know they did film on location mm-hmm. like and there was location shooting going on although it felt like a lot of it was being shot 
in COVID in the UK. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has that like Jurassic Park Dominion problem. Yes. Like this all, it all feels like a soundstage. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think the first 20 minutes helps that because Mm -hmm. you you clearly had this CGI artifice on Harrison Ford. But just really every shot of him in Tangier looks like a green screen, even if Mm -hmm. it kind of isn't. But it's this weird thing where it's like, you know those films like like Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow? Yes. It, it's all green screen film. Mm-hmm. And especially with the volume these days, it does have that vibe of like, it's just Harrison Ford on a volume mm-hmm. for, for two hours. Um, so yeah. actually that's an interesting question to ask. Do you, I, I imagine, so like when I read a book, I have a certain extra level of criticism that I bring to it because I know how books are made. When you watch a movie, I imagine you must see a lot more to it because you actually know how films are made. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of, I kind of hate how going into film has kind of ruined the fun of <laughs> cinema for me. Sometimes, you know what? It's ruined the fun of three out of four star films. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, the bubble like, movies. A great film is still a great film, and I love it. And I hate as you get older, it gets less. You know. You know, when you're a kid, just every film seemed good. Whereas, like, you get older these days, like, I'm amazed at, like, I turn off films halfway all the time these days, mm-hmm. where I just go, I've got the idea. I don't really mm-hmm. care. The third it's act's really, not going to change anything here at this I point. I don't really care how this turns out. Whereas, as a kid, I would never, like, have turned off a VHS I'd rented halfway through and kind of go, I've been done with it. But yeah, I I don't know what it is. I, I find I get, I get bored. Mm-hmm. a little bit easily in a lot of cinema kind of these days and i think i think it is just when you've seen a lot of films as well but especially kind of when you kind of see like just like plot structure mm-hmm. playing out you know I, I i think it can be and i also i miss the days as well where i could watch a film like 10 times you know whereas these days it's like i just find i get bored i have been doing recently now the now the film is done i kind mm-hmm. of like did watch bond films for years because which is very fair on and i recently i've got the book i've got aj chowdhury's book oh films and it's this amazing book it's this incredibly in-depth look at the bond films and aj is is a guy who's very into like the business and the behind the Mm -hmm. scenes deals and things and i'd always wanted to read his book in tandem with the films and i just couldn't bring myself Mm -hmm. to do it for years but I've just started that and I'm up to like on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Now you have these weird humps when you're watching. Mm-hmm. I'd never seen the Bond films in order before. And you kind of have this weird hump at Thunderball where you're like, oh, I've got to watch Thunderball. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so then, true. And then it, I, I'm now at the Diamonds of Forever hump mm-hmm. as well. You know, but I just I saw mm-hmm. On Her Majesty's Secret Service for the first time in years the other night. And it's so good. It's yeah. so good in a way which I didn't get when I was younger. Like there's mm-hmm. stuff like when he meets Tracy uh, mm-hmm. in the town, oh. after he escapes the Spectre base and he meets her there. And I'd never got it before, but the scenes where they're just running through the town and it's kind of mm-hmm. handheld. Yes. And they're kind of running through the town and then just like getting in the car on like the snowy roads. And it's like, it's like you're in like Switzerland in nine, mm-hmm. in Apres ski Switzerland in 1969. And it's just, it's so good mm-hmm. you know in this way that kind of other films aren't and it, it, it is weird i i don't know I, I i can kind of appreciate other things these days you know you know mm-hmm. when you're a kid it's like oh it's the aston martin and there's a <laughs> button you know whereas now i think often it's more like oh no there is some real like cinema well and especially the majesties because that was directed by peter hunt who was the editor on most of the other bond films and yeah. it's really adheres pretty close to the book the the yeah. tragedy of that film is simply i'm sorry george lazenby i i have a side photo from you behind me somewhere but you're not my favorite bond no he's, he's the worst james bond I yes mean, he's, he's... and it's this weird thing as you're watching as well you have that whole it's always that thing of like you ask it can there be a perfect film is mm-hmm. there such a thing as a perfect film like like can there be a film where there's nothing I would argue Casablanca, but that could be sentiment purely talking. Yeah, you could say that are some, yeah, or like maybe like North by Northwest is Mm -hmm. like a perfect film. But even in like, 
even in the films that are your favorites, there's still and, and in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, there's a thing where you can tell, and I swear it must have been United Artists or something would have given a note saying, because uh, right, here's a filmmaking thing. When you've made your film annoying people who are above, <laughs> I shouldn't say annoying people above you, they come in with notes and they come in with these ideas for changes. And often it's, oh, there's something here that's unclear. Mm-hmm. And so they use what you call ADR, you know, when you like re-record dialogue later and often uh-huh. to throw in bits of exposition while people's backs are turned, you know, and they'll say things like, oh, Tangier is very warm. To the place <laughs> where we are right now, which is Tangier, is unseasonably warm. And in that film, every uh-huh. time he turns his back, he says some really bad, very James Bond sounding thing. Like he, he eats the caviar. And he turns his back and he goes, oh, this is from the north of the Caspian. And you're like, it's so bad. And there's there's a lot of them in the film where he says these very like, you know, when Sean Connery will say, oh, Mm -hmm. that, oh, this is being served at the correct temperature of 39 degrees. Mm -hmm. They slip all of that stuff in. And every time you're like, oh, oh, this film's really good otherwise. But, but yeah, with him, it's like, you also have that weird thing if you spend the whole time being like, what if this was Connery's last or Moore's first? So it- my painful part with Connery is I don't like, of all performances, You Only Live Twice is my least favorite Connery performance. Because mm-hmm. he feels the most like he is just really done with this. Yeah. And so if he had been that version in On Her Majesty's, I'm not certain it would be that good, but I'd love to have seen Roger yeah. Moore like, dear goodness, what better way for Moore to start his tenure as Bond than as having literally the most amount of Bond girls in a film? Well, but also for for, for, for one who's considered almost like the kind of jokey James Bond, it would have been a crazily Casino royale star for him, you know, and it's like, it, it, it would have been, I imagine the Spectre rights were tied up, so there would have kind of been problems. But it, yeah, you, you have those weird versions of like, but you always have it in Bond. You're like you're like mm-hmm. Pierce Brosnan in The Living Daylight. Yep. You, you know Dalton in Goldeneye. You kind of always have those sort of weird. Have you seen um Mark Mark Eds? I always struggle to pronounce his last name. He wrote a book called The Lost Ed, The Lost James Bond Adventures or something like that. It's a book yep. entirely about the unfinished James Bond video games, comic books, scripts, yep. and it is fascinating as the what if of what could have happened yeah i i've heard of that book and i think there's like i think the the some kind of hero i'm not up mm-hmm. to it yet but i'm sure it has a lot on the third potential dalton but that mm-hmm. third dalton film is one of my favorite just yes. things to read about like just that i'm sure I, I loved timothy dalton it took me a oh, while to understand amazing. like like license to, I mean, often with Bond films, and again with Honor Magic, it's the same. It's actually the ones that are, are a bit different to the others that mm-hmm. stand out. And like, first time I saw License to Kill, I was like, this isn't a joke. What is this? You know, and now I'm like, it's the best movie ever. And it's like, mm-hmm. the thought of especially, you know, Bond skipped the era that is like Terminator 2. You, you know what yeah. I mean? Like 1995 mm-hmm. is a very sacred place for a lot of our film going and there's no bond in there. And it's like, especially that third Dalton film, like, mm-hmm. oh, you, you know, but I think as well, the Bond films, I, I know there's some criticism right now. They're not making a Bond film right now, but I, I think sometimes it is good for Bond to take a bit of time. Yes. Off. I mm-hmm. don't think Goldeneye would be Goldeneye if you'd made two other films. In between. In, in between, you, you yeah. know, and I think sometimes that kind of reset maybe is actually kind of useful in the end. And like, I know Bond fans kind of like hate it, but maybe it is good to let things settle mm-hmm. for five years. So you can imagine five years time a Bond film coming out, people will be really ready for it. Um, you know, whereas I think another one now is, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It, it just feels like a weird place to introduce. You, I can just see the trailer for a new Bond film dropping now and everyone just hating on it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that's the rough part. Like even when Craig was cast as Bond, 
like dear goodness i even as like my child brain at the time remember everyone being like james blonde and all of that hate on him and then the movie came out and everyone's like oh my goodness same thing happened with Batflex. same thing happened with heath ledger's the joker anytime it, it's just yeah. people don't like change we could bring back daniel craig and people would still complain Yes, yeah. I mean, you see with the Bond fans, it's like, oh, we should have Shirley Bassey come back and and do another another Bond thing, and oh, oh, we ha- and I think when they pandered to that, I mean, Bond, I think, is often best when it is something new and it's something you haven't mm-hmm. kind of seen before, you know. And it's why I say this before, but I have I do have this real thing for the Aston Martin. I hate how mm-hmm. they use it these days because it's like mm-hmm. it's, it's member berries now instead of it like, being functionally useful. <laughs> It's only in Goldfinger and the start of uh, the start. Thunderbolt. Of Thunderbolt. Like it's not the. B- I understand he uses the DB7 and, and other Aston Martins later on, but the, but there's also a massive twenty year gap of like no Aston Martins, and now every film when the Aston Martin get, it was cool in Casino Royale how it was done. Yes, but then especially in Skyfall and Spectre, yeah. every time it's revealed, it's like I'm stealing a joke from someone else here, but it's like it's like share emerging from a cloud of smoke. You know what I mean? Like it's it's unmasked and it's like every and then the theme music played and everyone's like oh oh it's the aston martin everyone it's the aston martin everyone and i think it's sort of endemic of a slight problems of yeah what you call like member berries well, where it's like don't need we don't mm-hmm. need the aston martin don't do that don't have the aston martin and get him to drive something new and cool so we're like oh mm-hmm. that's a new thing yeah um, in uh one of the i don't know if you've watched many of the marvel movies i kind of stopped after no way home and sure. that one, the premise that really hangs on is that you get all the villains from the other, yes, other Spider-Man movies. Great, it's a satisfying movie. But someone I watched a video essay on it, and they were like, pointed out, you know, we no longer have the opportunity to see what Tom Holland's Green Goblin would look like, because yeah. all we did was steal the version from another movie that did the good version. And yeah. that, that's just so sad because even though you might have that uh, that dopamine hit of, I recognize that, what it does is it really undermines the ability to be creative and to have something new and fresh to bring. Yeah, and it doesn't add, it creates weird, like, like say, you know how the end of, the, the final shot of Spectre, it's so weird. It's like he uh-huh. gets in, in the Aston Martin and everybody, uh-huh. and he like drives off in the Aston Martin. And it's this, I get what they do. It's like, wow, this is a great, Look, everyone, Bond's driving off in the Aston Martin, and you're kind of like, oh, is that, is 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 that its sort of thing? Um, yeah, I think on the on the other hand, though, I think especially now that's at Amazon. Yeah, and I know this is like dangerous territory, but you do kind of go like Dalton and Brosnan are still around, you know, and mm-hmm. especially and weirdly, Diamonds Are Forever in my watching right now. They have done the bringing back of James Bond before with Connery, like it. Mm-hmm. it it has been done and you do kind of go like in that Spider-Man no way home kind of way, like not a multiverse thing. Yeah. But like, especially with the market right now, like, like a, a Pierce Brosnan, James Bond film could be really interesting. Y- you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like he, why not have Pierce Brosnan's diamonds of forever? You know, why not just make it for like 70 million and just, uh, you know, I, I, I would think love now, to see a Bond movie made for 70 million. Well, it's just after just more Skyfall, from fascinating. Well, the problem is like Sky, and you were talking before about how you have like the die in other days and the skyfalls, mm-hmm. you know, like the 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 popcorn ones and the good ones. I think the problem with Skyfall is it raised the bar so high and like Bond films now have to win Oscars that you can see in Spectre and No Time they're to Die. Desperate. They're trying to make the it they're trying to make the best Bond movie ever. And because there's been five years between them. You know, whereas it's like just for a bit of fun, like why not just like like adapt one of the Fleming novels with, mm-hmm. with Pierce Brosnan and have it for seventy million, um, yeah, you know, and you know what I mean, and not trying to make it like this massive event mm-hmm. sort of thing, um, you know, but again, you know, be careful what be careful what you wish for. You know, we could be saying like, wow, it could be really cool to bring. Harrison Ford back as Indiana Jones for another time. You you do a scene with the de aging in the. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's hard. It's mm-hmm. hard filmmaking. <laughs> Actually, so one last thing I want to touch on. Uh, you've been doing a great job promoting this movie. What's the promotion promotional circuit been looking like for the other fellow? Because I, you are doing a phenomenal job based on the fact that 
I'm opening up my phone and there's a solid amount of time that I see talk about the film, which also testament to how good the movie is, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, I personally think it's half the job. Like, I, I, I really genuinely do. And I think it's like, you know, the old thing of like, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around, does it make a sound? But but I've seen this with other, you know, I was at film school with a lot of kind of like real artists, you know, and those real like indie filmmakers and they, you know, you know, they roll their cigarettes and they, you know what I mean, read marks and, and this sort of <laughs> thing and wear the Che Guevara t-shirts and this, you, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of saw with them that they 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 pour their heart and soul and often like money into into a film, but then they're almost like too cool to like kind of promote mm. it or kind of quite know how to kind of do that. Or a lot of artists I think are quite scared of actually putting themselves mm-hmm. out there. You know, they're fine if it's their work. You know, you mm-hmm. see this with a lot of people where it's like they're fine if it's their work, but then that they worry about what how they're gonna look and how they're gonna come across or sort of that sort of thing. Um, but whereas I think you, you, you absolutely have to, like, you have to kind of get out there and really like push your Mm -hmm. work because you do want people to see it and you, and you Mm -hmm. do want to be able to make another film, you know, and I don't know how behind the scenes this, but I'm trying to make another film right now. Mm -hmm. It's useful for the people I'm trying to get money from to make that film. If they Mm -hmm. Google Matthew Bauer, the other fellow that things come up on Google, you, you know, and it's like, you do see this with like a lot of films on film festivals. You'll see this like amazing film and not to rag too much my fellow filmmakers, but you'll see this amazing film mm-hmm. and it and it doesn't, they haven't made like an IMDB page for, for it. You, you know what I mean? Like just these kind of like basic kind of things. And it's like these days, especially in the internet, like y- mm-hmm. your film doesn't really exist unless it exists on mm-hmm. the internet, you know, and I can tell you behind the scenes because I know our kind of data with it is like no one comes to your official website like oh, people, yeah, no. people, people go like when have you ever been to like a film's official website right like it's your imdb page and your mm-hmm. wikipedia page and yep. all that kind of stuff that kind of gets it um and yeah i think you've really got to got to be on that stuff and i think you've also got to be willing to do podcasts and kind of that mm-hmm. kind of thing because it's like i think they call it like narrow casting a, a bit these days where it's like mm-hmm. you, 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 but you speak to a lot of podcasts, which, and this is no, no insult whatsoever. They don't have like a million listeners. Yeah. That, that That's not what it is, but a lot of kind of guys like, like you and a lot of people, they have a really dedicated fan base mm-hmm. who will really kind of listen to them and kind of go out. And I think it's important to kind of like really do that and really reach out to the fans um, you, you know, and that kind of thing as well. So yeah, I, we've, we've been pushing it as hard as we can yeah and you're doing a great job it's a film that's well worth seeing matt thank you so much for joining us on the show today where can people go learn more about you your work your upcoming projects and of course seeing the other fellow uh yeah yeah i mean i mean my website is mattbauerfilm.com one it's it's a slight a bit like james bond it's very hard to matt bauer is a reasonably common name so it's very hard to get yeah, I'm Matt Bauer film for everything because there's another Matt Bauer that stole all those handles. But anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, for the other fellow, um, it's available like reasonably worldwide. Um, mm-hmm. If you're in the US, which is where you guys are, it's on Prime Video for like, for, not like pay $5 on Prime Video. No, it's just, it's, just, it's on Prime. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And then it's on like Tubi as well. And Tubi's mm-hmm. actually, I never knew Tubi before this, but Tubi's kind of cool because you don't have to sign it's- up. Well, and it's got um, a great selection of weird old stuff. Just like old sword yeah. and sorcery films are apparently one of my jams. And you can watch Roger Corman sword and sorcery stuff. Yeah, I kind of went, I'd never heard of it till we were on there. I went on there and was like, this thing's kind of cool, actually. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's on Tubi there. It's on like Roku, on like the Roku channel, kind of just research mm-hmm. on there. And then if you're in the UK, it's now been released on ITVX um the, i always feel weird when i'm saying you can watch it for free it sounds really desperate being like you can watch it for free now but that's the you, model now well the, the, no i mean it's like it's like you know what it's like you have to pay two dollars for an app uh-huh. or something like we for a long time we were on amazon but you have to pay five dollars for it and that's like 
you know, I pay five dollars for a film on Amazon maybe once every two years, you, you know, or something. so yeah, it's nice that it's free now because it's like people can actually see it without because it's like if I heard it's just one more about, barrier. Oh, I if I heard there was a film about men named James Bond, I don't know if I'd pay nine dollars. The film's good. Like by the end, the film's good, but like it, it's it's a hump to pay nine dollars yes. for. So yes, yeah. ICVX or Prime Video, um, yes, you can watch it for free. And we will link all that in the show notes. Matt, thank you again for joining us on the show. Awesome. Thank you very much, Terrence. Really nice meeting you as well. Pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt.